Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast, conversations about creating a culture of activity. My name is John Zimmerman. I'm the founder of the Active Towns Initiative, and I'm honored to serve as your host each week on this podcast journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Today is Friday, October 8th, 2021, and I'm delighted to welcome Michael Williams into the Active Towns virtual studios for a conversation about edge lane roads. Now, if you're not yet familiar with this type of roadway treatment, well, you are in for a treat. Trust me, they are pretty darn cool when done well. But before we roll into that conversation and cover those details, please allow me a brief moment to say that this episode is once again being brought to you by the generous contributions of our donors, sponsors, and monthly patrons on our Patreon page. If you'd also like to help support my efforts by making a contribution, just head over to my website at activetowns.org and navigate to the donation page. It's also important to mention that there are a few other ways that you can help support the effort. First is to subscribe to the audio podcast via your preferred listening platform. The second is to subscribe to the Active Towns YouTube channel. Just be sure to click on the bell next to the subscribe button so that you'll get an alert when I post new videos. And finally, please help spread the word about the Active Towns initiative within your personal and professional networks as appropriate. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for whatever support you're able to provide as I strive to grow this movement to create a culture of activity for all ages and abilities. Okay, let's get this discussion about Edge Lane Roads with Michael Williams rolling. Well, Michael, it's so wonderful to connect with you here today. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Thank you, John. Happy to be here. So our, our topic today is to introduce and demystify the edge lane road, or as some members of the audience may know it, the advisory bike lane treatment. Um, and we're going to dive into a lot of those details and, and, and define it and all that good stuff in our discussion. Um, but to kick, kick this off, um, why don't you just share a little bit about yourself and uh, how you come to be interested in, in this uh, particular field of study? Well, I spent most of my life in the rural environment, small towns, in the mountains, etc. So that is my, that's the perspective I come from. Uh, also, I've been a cyclist all my life. Uh, and so much of my cycling experience has been in the rural environment. And so I'm, I'm most attuned to the problems, potential solutions, the, the way solutions don't work when they're moved from the urban to the rural environment, et cetera. So when I, when I visited the Netherlands and discovered this treatment, uh, I thought it was great. Uh, you know, in rural areas, you have these roads that just have very few cars on them, but they've got a center line down the middle, and you are either in the travel lane or you're in the drainage ditch next to the road. So uh, so when I saw this uh, treatment, I knew this was something that fit our rural environment well and uh, come to learn that it also fits quite a few urban uh, settings also. So. It was that rural perspective combined with the discovery of this treatment in the Netherlands that led me to believe that this is something we really need to have in our toolbox in the U.S. Uh, so, Michael, I was digging into your, your 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 CV a little bit and your background. Now, you don't have necessarily formal training in this area until much later in your life. So what were you doing in the, in the first part of your career? Uh, you're, you're right. Uh, civil engineering, active transportation is the third career in my life. Uh, my first career was as a uh, oh, computer, software, hardware, biomedical engineer. Uh, I went down to the Silicon Valley, and uh, uh, the primary job I had there was as a uh, developer, did a little bit of research on the first implantable defibrillator ever uh, with a small company 
by the name of Ventratex that no longer exists. It's been swallowed up by one of the large companies that like to do that. Uh, so I did that for, I think, about 15 years. Uh, medical medical applications of computer software and hardware. And then I moved back to the rural area, back to the mountains, beautiful little town of Mount Shasta, where I became a general contractor. And I primarily worked in public works, roads, bridges, schools, uh, different things like that. I'd always had a hobby of construction. And I said, hey, I can do this for for my job as well. So I, I did that for about the same number of years, right around 15 years. And all during this time, I, I had pursued self-education around active transportation, transportation in general. And then once I felt my enthusiasm for the construction world ebbing, I told myself, I'm going to go up, get a degree in civil engineering and uh, and start working in an area that I've been passionate about since I was in my 20s, I believe. So that's what I did. I went to Portland State University, one of the best campuses in the country for this type of area, and uh, went from there. Yeah, fantastic. Now let's go back to what you were talking about before, because you, you sort of... Uh, wove into and you've just alluded to it that uh, you did a trip in your 20s and you had an opportunity to uh, visit the Netherlands. So when was that about? Oh, well, I've been to the Netherlands three times, maybe four times, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, where most of those trips I was just traveling, right. uh, having a good time and uh, road bikes. But I didn't have my active transportation goggles on, right? I just enjoyed the the freedom, the luxury of of being safe and comfortable on my bike in, in that in that country. The last time I went was actually on a uh, a guided tour with Dr. Peter Firth, uh, where we got great access to some of the engineers. The the local engineers there in the Netherlands. We went and saw particular installations. Uh, so that was when I discovered the, the edge lane road treatment. Fantastic. That's great. So uh, I, I get the sense then that, uh, you know, that when you were there the first time, that wasn't necessarily the time where you, you had that thinking cap on and were, were like kind of going, oh, well, this is a neat treatment. You, you were just like really enjoying the fact that you were traveling and had an opportunity to, to you know, experience a, a different lifestyle. Is that about right? Yeah. I mean, the Netherlands is a great place to go, whether you like bikes or not. Uh, and if you like bikes, it's a fantastic place to go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what I thought I'd do to, to sort of tee this up is, and I shared with you before we hit the record button, that uh, uh, we're on a, a new video platform here, uh, being able to, to share some content. And, and I thought it would be fun for us to, to actually um, show you a, a little video that uh, was sitting on my iPad. I had no idea that this was out there. It was from a trip that I did in in the Netherlands in 2018. And as I was loading the iPad up with some of your photos, I'm like, oh, you're going to get a kick out of this. So let me let me cue this up right. and and we'll we'll uh, uh, hopefully uh, the, the technology wizards will allow us to um, uh, jump right into this and have some fun with it. And uh, let's head on over and hopefully you can see that. Yes, yes, it looks beautiful. All right, so here is that video as, as I was heading out to the airport. And I got a good chuckle out of this because uh, a lot of it just, you know, really demonstrates some of the things that, uh, that you talk about. So is this in Amsterdam? This is, yeah, this is in uh, some of the neighborhoods between uh, Amsterdam proper and heading out to, to the airport. So this would definitely be a, a urban slash suburban context. So anyways, I just thought it would be fun <laughs> to share that to, 
to uh, you know kind of set the scene, if you will, you know, for the the, the audience to be able to look at this. Uh, for for those of you who are listening to to this as a podcast audio only, you just missed some amazing video. You're going to have to head over to the video version of this particular podcast because we've got some really good stuff out there. But um, I thought it would be neat to to show you that just because a it it tickled me that I went out there and found it <laughs> out on my iPad as I was loading some of your photos in there. And two, I just thought it was a, a, a wonderful example to what you were just saying is that it's that um, that combination of it, we, we've seen it out there applied in rural environments. But here's a, a context that's very much a, more of a suburban type of urban application of it. So I thought it'd be nice to, to talk a little bit about that as a visual for you to then take take this over and uh, help us out with some definitions and and what these uh, these beasts are in terms of you know facilities so take it away professor right so okay i i don't have my phd but uh, <laughs> uh, but i do know something about these things so uh that video if you uh if you folks that have seen the video that he showed, uh, you'll note that there was no center line painted or marked on the roadway. That that's an important part of an edge lane road uh, facility. Uh, and what you did have were broken lines or dashed lines on either side, uh, splitting the road up into essentially three different lanes, if you will. Uh, the center lane is shared by cars going both directions. Uh, the center lane is not normally wide enough for two cars to pass one another, uh, staying within that center lane. If you have two cars that approach one another, they need to merge into one of those two edge lanes to complete the pass. And then once they've completed the pass, they move back into the center lane and continue on their way. The edge lanes that are created by the, uh, the dashed or broken lines there are intended for vulnerable road users. In the video you just showed, it's intended specifically for cyclists. But uh, I've seen uh, equestrians in, in those lanes and really could use them for any type of vulnerable road user. Uh, wheelchair users, pedestrians, uh, there are a number of edge lane road installations in the U.S. that were installed explicitly to support pedestrians. Uh, so it really doesn't matter whether it's bicycles or people walking or people riding a horse or on mobility devices. Uh, what it is, it's, is it's just a slightly different way to share that roadway width rather than the normal uh, what, uh, look that we've come to expect, which is a center line down the middle of the road, maybe no other markings as well, uh, which guarantees that you're in the travel lane no, no matter where you're at on that road. Uh, if you have a sidewalk, then you're lucky, you're a pedestrian, you get to be on the sidewalk. Uh, but if you're on the roadway, uh, normally those narrow roads, uh, you're in the travel lane and you've got cars coming up from behind you, uh, et cetera. So it's a much, much more friendly and a much more uh, reasonable <laughs> way to share the roadway with, but that's my bias showing. Right, right. And... Uh... There you we'll, go. Uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll move our photo over to this side here, just like that. And uh, there you go. There's there's that example that you you just gave in terms of. Um, a, I think this is a is this a Dutch uh, application here? It is. This okay. is outside of Utrecht, I believe. Okay. And so, as you mentioned, you know, more vulnerable users of the road space. Uh, you had mentioned that if there were sidewalks present, then. Uh, and then maybe pedestrians uh, wouldn't need to be sharing this space. It, it looks like there's not much in the way of sidewalks in this particular context. So this is truly a shared space, whether it's uh, the uh, the uh, uh, bipedal types of uh, folks or whether we have uh, the four-leggeds uh, also sharing the space. So good stuff. I wanted to um, kind of cue up a couple of other uh, photos that, uh, that that we had here. And uh, and talk a little bit more about them. So here's a, another one that that you passed along that 
really, I think, exemplifies what you were just describing in terms of having, uh, you know, the space. And on, on the one side, it looks like there is a sidewalk space, but on the other side, uh, not so much. And in fact, there's a pedestrian occupying that space. Um, talk a little bit about why it is we see this type of treatment, um, you know, over in the Netherlands. And it, it looks like Denmark has also embraced them and, and several other countries. What's a little bit of the history behind why they're there and, and not necessarily everywhere else? Well, that's a good question. I'm not, I, I don't have all the answers for that question. Uh, my understanding is that at least in the Netherlands, this was a treatment that arose out of the government department that's responsible for all of the dikes, all of the levees and dikes that hold back the water in the Netherlands. And they have quite a few roads that run along the top of the dikes. And of course, these roads are fairly narrow. And so when they wanted to accommodate vulnerable road users on those roads, this is the solution they came up with. Uh, with respect to other countries, I think the the idea really spread from the Netherlands to, to other countries as people became aware of it. This picture here in particular is a uh, is from Denmark. It's a Danish uh, edge lane road. You can tell by the, the width of the broken lines there. Um, but they have, they've modified some of the engineering guidance, uh, to make this, uh, treatment their own, um, based on the research and the safety data they have. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's been used in the Netherlands, Germany, Japan, Denmark, Great Britain, uh, and some other Scandinavian countries. But those are the primary users that I'm aware of outside of the U.S. and Canada. Fantastic. Um, pull up a, a, another one here. Um, why, the, why the unhappy face on this one? Well, so this, this again, is a, Danish, uh, is a Danish installation. And this, I, I love this picture because of the, it's such a great way to do road user education. Um, you know, you've got a little bit of peer pressure there where they're, they're literally frowning on the behavior. And what they're trying to communicate is, hey, this is a road where motor vehicles belong in the center lane. You don't want to be edging over into those edge lanes. Uh, so it's, I just found this amusing. Uh, it's road user education, pure and simple. And, of course, in the uh, uh, classic European way, they don't write it out in some language that a visitor may be un unable to understand. They use... Uh, a very graphic, very direct way to, to get their message across. Yeah, fantastic. And, and uh, I think, the, you know, the Danes the, in Denmark is a great place, you know, for this. Uh, they tend to be rule followers anyway. So <laughs> this is a, a, a nice reminder that uh, <clears throat> a nice, stern, unhappy face that, yeah, don't, don't be uh, straddling that line there. Uh, a couple of other uh, fun ones. Um, this one I thought was interesting in that uh, it looks like the, the, the space that is reserved off to the side then gets blocked. What can you tell us about what's, what's happening with this treatment? And it does look like it's also a, another Danish installation. Well, if you, I'm, not, I'm not sure I know this facility, but if you look, there is space. Uh, so what you're coming up to is a choke point, right? right. Uh, it's a treatment intended to slow drivers. Uh, but uh, if you look on either side of the choke point islands, there is a, a space for cyclists or vulnerable road users to go around those islands. Uh, so as a vulnerable road user comes up to that, they would go around the outside of the islands and, uh, and the drivers would be forced to go through the middle. Uh, it looks like in this case, as you blew it up, there appears to be a trail crossing the street and so this is a way to slow drivers at a crossing crosswalk uh probably a fairly well used trail I'm, I'm guessing um but yeah it's just a traffic calming uh device used on an edge lane road installation yeah 
And I would I, I would even echo to to the fact that it's probably a traffic calming device for cyclists too, because it, it there's yeah. literally uh, an impediment in the middle of uh, in the quote unquote lane there that they, they have. So that's that's good stuff. Let's uh, let's take a look at another another one and, and spur this because this is an example from I believe from Japan. Is that correct? Correct. I think this is the. And I, I'm not going to be able to remember how to say it correctly, but I think it's the Kanazawa Prefecture, or it, it's a suburb of Tokyo, I believe, somewhere around Tokyo. But the, the real interesting thing about this one is that it has split the edge lanes up into pedestrian and bicycle uh, areas. And I, I don't know Japanese road marking uh, intent, but I'm guessing that the pedestrian area, which is next to the edge of the road, it's marked with a solid line and the bicycle area is marked with a dashed line. So my assumption is that the dashed area is available for cars to pass one another, but that pedestrian area is off limits. Uh, but again, I, I, I don't claim to know the, the exact meaning of road markings on the in, the, in Japan, but this is a this is an interesting uh, concept to me. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it sure is. We'll, uh, we'll bring us uh, back to our other view here, and and we'll uh, we'll pull up one of your slides in just a moment. But um, one of the things that comes to mind when I first saw this installation really being readily used in the Netherlands. Uh, gosh, it must have been way back in 2015 on my first trip there that I was just like, wow, this is this is fascinating because it's it's not the protected infrastructure and it's not the same flavor of shared infrastructure that the feet struts are or the bicycle priority streets. It, it's a it's a different stripe altogether. And um, and it and it just worked really, really well. But one of the things that I really um, reflected on was the fact that what made it work so well were um, the motor vehicle speeds are definitely, you, you use the word traffic calmed. They're definitely much more uh, forgiving to having this type of design or perhaps said in another way, the design really encourages slower speeds. Um, Talk a little bit about that, and then I'm wondering if it might make sense for us to queue up that video, um, either either of the two videos that you sent over, either the Ottawa one or the one from New Hampshire. So address the speed, and then if it makes sense, we'll, we'll, we'll queue up the video. Well, uh, we're talking about two different cultures when we compare the Netherlands and the U.S. Uh, in the Netherlands, most drivers are also bicycle riders. Uh, in the U.S., not so much. So that that leads to a bit of a uncertainty in my mind about how to apply this treatment, where to apply this treatment, uh, where this treatment will be successful. But what I've seen with the research I've done on the installations we have already in the U.S. is that drivers respond to this treatment very appropriately. Uh, and of course, right now, the, the federal guidance that's out there uh, specifies a maximum speed of 35 miles an hour and a maximum volume of 6,000 6, cars per day. Uh, to my mind, there's a lot that needs to be improved about that guidance. That is the subject of some of the articles I've published. Uh, for example, I don't think a 6,000 cars per day road at 35 miles an hour is going to be a comfortable place to ride for most people, um, especially at peak volumes. But if you get down in the lower volumes and the lower speeds, uh, you're looking at a treatment that could easily be used as an all ages and abilities. Uh, for example, one of the first mentions of this treatment in any guidance in the U.S. was the uh, still very good uh, handbook on bicycle boulevards that was created by Mia Burke and, uh, and a couple of other authors who I, I forget at the moment, where they said, hey, this 
advisory bike lane was the term they used. This advisory bike lane treatment is an excellent way to mark a bicycle boulevard, neighborhood greenway, whatever uh, you choose to call it. Because what it does that gets the vulnerable road users out of the lane where the cars are, right? You've got them horizontally separated. And it's only when two cars need to pass that you need to do some extra negotiation and, uh, and merge into that edge lane, which if you're on a street that's suitable for a bicycle boulevard, those types of passing operations shouldn't be happening very frequently. Uh, in terms of speed and volume, the real enemy of this treatment is volume. If you have too many cars, that makes a mess. If you have too many cyclists, even, the cars don't have a place to pull over to accomplish the pass. So that can also be a problem. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the too many bicyclists problem in the U.S. very often. In the Netherlands, they do. Uh, and so that is one of the, the reasons they will choose not to use an edge lane road treatment in the Netherlands is if they have too many cyclists. Uh, speed is a little bit of a different issue. Speed, uh, obviously is a risk factor. It makes any, uh, crash worse. Uh, severity goes up as speed goes up, as everyone well knows. Um, but there are examples of edge lane roads. Uh, one in particular that I'm aware of in Scotland, where it's 60 miles an hour, about 1400 cars a day, and it's marked as an edge lane road. The engineer that put it in loves it. It's been in place for, I think, 15 years now. He says safety is much better than it was before, and he would love to do it uh, on more streets, but people are too freaked out about it. They won't let him do it. So speed is a bit of a different issue. There is comfort. There is uh, a severity issue, but it's not nearly as big an impact as the volume. Before we uh, queue up the the video, uh, you, you mentioned sort of the other name. The, this particular treatment has several different names, as I learned when I was out on your website. So you use the, the, the term advisory bike lanes, and, and many people may know them as that. Uh, why is that not necessarily a, a good term to use? Why is edge lane road a better way to go? Well, so they're they're known by the names I'm aware of that are most commonly used in the U.S. are dash bike lanes, which almost nobody but the FHWA uses. And then there's advisory shoulders and advisory bike lanes, and then edge lane roads. Uh, the problem with advisory shoulder and advisory bike lanes is that these edge lanes are neither shoulders nor are they bike lanes. Uh, both of the terms shoulder and bike lane come with very specific legal and regulatory baggage. Shoulders are not part of the travel way. They are not intended to have motor vehicles in them. Bike lanes are intended to be exclusively used for, by bicyclists, uh, with the rare exception when cars need to cross them to get to access parking, et cetera. Uh, so with the legal context of those concepts, uh, shoulder and bike lanes are both a poor choice. Uh, and that's why edge lane roads is, is the name I prefer. It's a name used in Denmark. Uh, and it appears to be uh, being adopted more and more in the U.S. Okay. You think you're getting some uh, some traction on that here in, in North America? Yeah, I was just looking at my at my website details, and the, the Edge Lane Road search term has really not been showing showing up anywhere. Yeah. And in the most recent month, I think it was maybe 10 or 20% of the search terms. It's, it's normally advisory bike lane. People are using, but Got it. edge lane roads are starting to to gain their own yeah, following. Yeah. All right, let's uh, let's let's queue up that video from Ottawa because I think it's it's really snappy and and gets right to it. Of course, they end up calling it advisory bike lane, but <laughs> we'll 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 do that and and uh, and chat a little bit about it. It's it's very short. It's it's not too long. And can so, I can I introduce yeah. it a little bit? Yeah. So yeah. This is a video that uh, the city of Ottawa put out to introduce people to the concept, to the treatment, and how to operate on it. Uh, and it's if anybody out there is looking for a video to to do this, to introduce the concept, the behaviors expected, 
this is a really good one to use. It's available on my website if you need to go look at it. Fantastic. Let's queue it up. Ottawa is about to be one of the first cities in Canada with advisory cycling lanes. Popular in Europe and in the US, the system is great for adding cycling lanes to streets where they wouldn't otherwise fit. Narrow roads with low volume traffic and low speeds. Here's how they work. Traffic from both sides share one center lane. Cycling lanes are placed on each side of the road. When there are two drivers traveling in opposite directions, the vehicles move into the cycling lanes to pass each other safely. What happens if there's a bike in the cycling lane? Whoever is in front has the right of way. Vehicles travel behind the bike, but can then move back into the center lane when it is safe to do so. It is a whole new way for drivers and cyclists to share the road. Find out more at ottawa.ca. Fantastic. Like I said, nice and snappy and, and gets right to it. Um, when you show people that video, what's, what's their response? Well, I don't show people that video very often. <laughs> very uh, often? <laughs> well, because normally I'm doing presentations and it's mm -hmm. always, it's, sometimes it's a bit dicey to do video inside yeah. your, uh, your uh, presentation, but, uh, uh, I show them stills. I show them uh, uh, pictures from the small town guide, the FHWA small town and rural multimodal network guide. Uh, but there are, if I'm dealing with an audience to which this concept is brand new, there's always somebody that says, this is crazy. You're putting us into a game of chicken. And uh, I always come back with, well, you know, what happens on narrow alleys? What happens on residential streets where you've got cars parked on both sides and you, you don't have enough room for two cars to get past? What happens on one lane bridges? What happens in narrow shopping mall parking lots? Uh, streets that are not yet fully plowed after a snowstorm. On and on and on. This type of behavior, this negotiating for space to pass an oncoming vehicle it's a behavior that drivers all across the world do hundreds of millions of times a day or a week i don't know the ex actual number but it's a behavior that is common for us as drivers in the u.s to do yeah, yeah. it just happens well I, I have reflected many times here on the podcast that that's exactly the situation here in our neighborhood in in austin texas uh, you know, it's an older neighborhood, you know, platted probably in the 1930s. Many of the streets are narrow enough so that uh, if there's cars parked on either side of the street, uh, the remaining <laughs> real estate that's left over in the middle is so narrow that it becomes a yield street. So you're absolutely right. That behavior of traveling with care, slowing down, uh, yielding and negotiating, uh, you know, who gets to go, who doesn't, you know, et cetera, is, is much more common than I think a lot of us realize or give it credit for. Yeah. And, and one thing that, that video stated was that it's a good treatment for roads that are too narrow for standard bike lane. And that, that's a characterization that I don't agree with. It, it can be used for that. But there are also other use cases that this treatment really uh, does well at. Um, for example, uh, referring back to the Netherlands again, the city of Utrecht, long known as one of the most, if not the most, progressive city in terms of uh, accommodating bicyclists within the Netherlands. Uh, they recently removed a standard two-lane street with bike lane and transformed it into an edge lane road. And that was because they weren't getting the low speed they wanted. The uh, bike lanes were hard up against a parking lane, which is not something they like to do. Uh, and it, they wanted a calmer, quieter, more comfortable road. And when they did that, they got fewer autos on that road. They got lower speed. They lowered the speed limit at the same time, the edge lane road. Uh, and they got more cyclists. So in Utrecht, most progressive city in the Netherlands, they took out standard bike lanes, put an edge lane road, and got great results. So it is, there are situations where an edge lane road can be better than a standard bike lane. 
Uh, I've also seen instances in the U.S. where, there you go, Molly Single, and I'm sure I'm butchering it. Uh, yeah, in let's, uh, let's move us down here so we can see that. So this is the before treatment that you were just talking about where uh, you know, motor vehicles were present and, uh, and, and clearly parking <laughs> on the edge there. And then the, the after uh, treatment ends up looking more like this. And you can see the data that's also uh, presented there. Yeah, and this is courtesy. I think I got this from Mark Wagenberg's uh, yeah, fantastic touch. blog. Uh, and so, yeah, as I said, number of bikes went up significantly, number of cars dropped, and, of course, the speeds dropped because they, they dropped the speed limit from 50 to 30 kilometers an hour. But, you know, this is a situation where the road was just wide enough for bike lanes and two travel lanes. And what that ends up doing is it really sandwiches the cyclist between the moving cars and the parking lane. And you've got very little horizontal clearance, very little space to feel comfortable. And if you move to an edge lane road, you can actually increase that horizontal clearance between the moving cars and the cyclist quite significantly. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Let's uh, take a look at um, a, a couple different scenes. Well, let me ask you this. Um, so the other video that we have, it's a little bit longer, um, but it's it, it's actually a, a U.S. example. We're talking about New Hampshire here. Um, it, do you think it's worth it to, to go ahead and play that and, and, and show that? Or should I fast forward it all or, or just let it roll? It's not that long. Uh, sure. We can, uh, we can roll it and yeah. talk about it. Yeah, feel free to, to, to just interject. We're going to be floating, you know, heads off to the side anyway. So okay. <laughs> we, we, we can just kind of, uh, you know, do our own little uh, ongoing commentary as as that comes up. So let me, let me see if I can pull that up here. Let's pop over. So this Downtown is, Hanover is a compact mix of businesses, restaurants, and opportunities for shopping. Directly adjacent is Dartmouth College. East of these two major destinations lies the core of in-town Hanover housing all within walking and biking distance. Valley Road sees comparatively less traffic than other routes into town and serves the town as a collector street for pedestrians and cyclists. This portion of Valley Road has the advisory lanes painted on it. Valley Road currently has advisory lanes, a shared street concept that gives equal priority to vehicles and other road users. The road has one center lane for cars and two shoulders, indicated by dashed lines that pedestrians and cyclists share. Let's take a look at how it works. Cars and trucks on Valley Road share the center lane. When no bikes or walkers are present, two cars coming from opposite directions move into the shoulders to pass each other. Once they've passed, they move back into the center lane. When a car passes bicycles, the car can stay in the center lane. However, the car can also move into the opposite shoulder to give the bikers more room. This is the part I love best. <laughs> yeah, this, this does a great job at il illustrating what what to expect on an edge lane road. And, uh, you know, Hanover, this is one of the earlier installations in the U.S. Okay. And so it was fairly new. Uh, and, you know, all you have to this do is... This shows the perspective of a person walking against traffic. Here are some bikes passing the pedestrian in the shared travel lane. Cars wait their turn to use the road. Now that the bikes have passed the pedestrian... The cars can pass. This time, the car has time to pass when reaching the pedestrian. Then the oncoming car waits for the bikes to pass the walker. I'm going to pause that just for a second, just to, to make this sort of commentary of, uh, it, it's extraordinary to see the amount of bikes and pedestrians out there. Clearly, they feel uh, you know, quite comfortable, you know, occupying the space. And you know, for the most part, the motor vehicle drivers are proceeding with, you know, due caution. Uh, and, and obviously it's, it, it's probably an indication that it has been in place for so long and, uh, and, and people have become really, really accommodated to this treatment. Um, wh what are your thoughts along those, along those lines? Is that a big part of it is getting, the facility down and then giving it time to to season and mature and, and become something that people are become used to? There is that process that occurs. Uh, as part of the research that I've done, 
on installations in the U.S., one of the things I've asked about is how much prior public outreach, how much education was done before the installation was installed? What kind of response did you get? Did the agency receive once it was installed, et cetera? And what I found was uh, there are two installations that were removed uh, after they were installed. Both of them suffered from a lack of public education beforehand. And the, and the agencies that did a lot of public education beforehand got almost zero uh, negative comments about the installation after it was installed. Uh, there are examples of installations where almost no education was done, uh, but in a lot of those, and most of those actually, drivers reacted uh, appropriately. They slowed down, they drove in the middle, they negotiated for space. So really what happens is uh, there is an advantage to telling people, educating them about the concept, telling them it's coming, uh, because it's going to lessen your negative feedback once it's installed. But it's not truly necessary for uh, for it to work correctly. Uh, the two that were removed after installation, one was in a fairly wealthy, affluent area, suburb of Minneapolis, and it was kind of their main street uh, to the golf country club. It also had marked parking on either side that was very, uh, very uh, unused, and so the markings were a bit confusing. So you had an older population, you had that... <laughs> That pattern that tends to happen where people don't like change and when it's introduced to them suddenly and they have political connection, they can get that change reversed. Uh, so there is that issue. But, uh, yeah, public education is good just to ensure a bit more acceptance. But people use it appropriately whether they know what's expected or not uh, from the stories I've heard from agency representatives. Yeah, it seems like if you get the design right, <laughs> you know, in, in other words, it's designed well, uh, you're able to keep, keep those speeds down and then it becomes, you know, intuitive. You know, again, one of the, the main rules of, of, you know, any kind of shared space is, you know, creating that, that balance between uh, organized chaos. There you go. <laughs> you know, uh, of, of, does it, does it make the drivers feel just a little bit uncomfortable? And if so, they'll slow down. And, uh, but at the same, you know, same, uh, token, you, you've got, uh, a situation where the, the constraints are there. In other words, that center lane isn't too wide to the point where it encourages, you know, truly, truly fast, uh, you know, motor vehicle speeding. And so I think that that's, that's a big part of it. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, to talk with you about is, um, is that design. And so I'm going to pull up, uh, you know, the better than bike lanes slide that you have. And, um, and the caveat to this is, is in the setup to this that I'll, I'll give, this is my commentary, is that this is better than bike lanes the way we used to build bike lanes. So walk us through this, uh, this diagram here. All right. Well, so this is a comparison between what is probably the most common type of bike infrastructure provided in the country nowadays and, uh, and the edge lane road. Uh, and this, this comparison is only valid for roads that are lower volume, lower speed, where an edge lane road uh, will work. And what you have on the top of the slide is is an example of the traditional bike lane. I think I even made it, yeah, it's six feet wide in this case, so wider than a lot of bike lanes that are out there now. But you've got a bike lane that's sandwiched in between the parking lane and a travel lane. So if you are appropriately cautious as a rider and you're trying to avoid that door zone, uh, you really have very little space, very a very narrow envelope. I think uh, five feet, if I see there correctly, a five foot envelope in, in which you can ride and that envelope is hard up against a traveling car and you got a little fudge into the door zone area. 
So your horizontal clearance is not great in this type of facility. And that's with a six foot lane. Uh, but if you compare that to an edge lane road installation, you can uh, create buffers between the parking lane and the edge lane. And that not only allows a place for drivers and passengers to swing their doors open and access their cars, but that gives you a place for garbage cans or the uh, the pile of leaf clippings on the days they go to pick up leaves and branches. So, you know, all of the junk that ends up on the street in normal bike lanes. Uh, you also can have a much wider edge lane. Uh, I think in this example, I made it eight foot wide. Uh, and a drive lane of 10 foot, which is uh, more than wide enough for a center lane on edge lane road installation. And so what you have is you have a very, uh, you have a large increase in that horizontal clearance between both the moving vehicles and the parked vehicles. And that just, uh, you know, that improves safety, it improves comfort. And so on the right street, an edge lane road is going to give you a much better experience as a cyclist than your standard bike lanes will. Yeah. And what I like about this, uh, this photo too, is that it, it does add uh, an element that was absent in many of the photos that we looked at. And, and that is the on-street parking. Um, and so it, 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 I think is, I like the way that you, you know, have that diagrammed out with that door zone buffer, you know, giving, you know, that, that nice, uh, you know, space there for the, the, the bike lane and really, uh, you know, constraining that traveling, that tra traveling of just 10 feet is there. Um, but as we saw from the videos, as we saw from the diagrams, it works and, uh, motor vehicles will, you know, motor vehicle drivers will slow down and proceed with caution and uh, I think what I'd like to do now is have you comment a little bit about uh, uh, some of the, the photographs that we have uh, that you'd sent over, because uh, I, we, we have proof. You, you sent me proof <laughs> that these exist in the United States. And uh, and so we, we do have a few photos that uh, that we can share with folks and, and, and kind of walk through them. Um, this this first set is. Uh, I think they're in a row. Let's see here. They're labeled uh, some of the North American examples. And uh, let's pull this one up here and you can walk us through it. So what are we looking at here? So this, this is a really interesting application of edge lane roads. Uh, this is a small town in the state of Washington. Uh, it's called Port Townsend. Uh, it's got a... Uh, a central business district that was built oh, around the turn of the century, I believe. It was uh, it was supposed to be the Seattle of Washington uh, until the railroad ended up in a more closer to Seattle rather than Port Townsend. But this was a busy port uh, port destination in the old days. Um, but this is the main street in downtown Port Townsend, and they established an edge lane road. If you go back to that prior picture, they established an edge lane road because they have a tradition of allowing delivery trucks to park in the middle of the road. If you see that, it's barely visible. There's a transverse white line in the middle of the road there, and that indicates, that indicates hey, you should park here to make your deliveries. There are no alleys behind these buildings. Uh, so there's no way to take your deliveries into the buildings. So they said, we want to accommodate bicyclists, but we have this problem with trucks, park, big trucks parking in the middle of the road. How do we do this? Uh, so what they came up with was the edge lane road uh, treatment. They have a speed limit of 20 miles an hour. And the interesting thing about this installation is that uh, they see volumes up around 7,000 cars a day which is higher than the mandatory 6,000 cars per day threshold where the MUTCD requires the use of a center line. So here's an example where, hey, it doesn't have to be per the book and it can still work and work safely. You've got high volumes, but you've got low speeds. People are careful. They're negotiating. 
and uh, and it works very well for them. They're they're happy with the treatment, and in fact, uh, they are extending it to other roads within the town uh, very soon. And I believe these uh, additional photos are also from Port Townsend, correct? This is Port Townsend as well. It looks like there's a center line mark there, but that's from construction. That's not a permanent uh, mark. So that is not a center line, folks. That is part of the, the travel lane. Now, I will say that that travel lane, uh, that center lane, uh, is quite generous. That's much more than the 10 feet that you had on your diagram. Right. Uh, so a, a cen- they made their center lane wider because of this issue with the trucks parking in the middle. So they, they had a bit different uh, set of circumstances to deal with. Yeah, you can actually see that transverse white line just in front of the, the cyclist there on the left with the, the purple sweater. So absolutely beautiful. And how long has this installation been in place? Uh, this has been in place for a little over a year, I believe. Okay. Fantastic. Proof that it can be done. It can be done. And here's, you know, this is Main Street USA. Where Main you Street USA, yes, absolutely. Delivery trucks, trucks parking in the middle of the road. So it, it's very much a, uh, a negotiating way of handling uh, getting down the road. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You had mentioned, you know, uh, an installation that was sort of taken away um, because it was in you know, sort of an affluent area. And uh, I'm going to pull up the photos that you sent over from, from Vail. And uh, these are actually roads that I know quite well because I spend a lot of time in Vail. And um, it, it's, it, it can be done <laughs> it, pretty much anywhere. It's just a, a matter of, again, getting the design right. And, uh, and I can't recall in, in Vail whether they did much outreach and education, um, you know, for these facilities. I, I, I just sort of helicopter in every once in a while. I don't spend a lot of time there, nowhere near as much time as when I lived in Boulder, I'd be up there almost every other weekend. So, uh, I can tell you, I've, I've ridden on these roads. I've filmed a lot on these roads and, uh, uh, there, they also have other types of treatments too as well as shared space areas in the village and uh, uh, other types of, of shared space concepts that help you know, reinforce what we're talking about here is uh, you know, encouraging the drivers to slow down and be cognizant and uh, careful with the more vulnerable road users that are out there. Yeah, the talking to the town engineer from City of Ale, I- I had him join me to uh, present on this uh, installation at a couple of different, I think at the ITE international meeting and, and one other conference, I can't remember at the, at the moment, but this is a, a very successful, very well used installation. This is where they have a, uh, a popular trail called the Gore Valley Trail that runs through the valley that Avail sits within. And they needed to, connect the trail across this street and they were looking for ways to make that happen and make it safe make it comfortable and they decided upon this uh, treatment and as you can see from the pictures uh, they get quite a few peds and bikes uh, I don't remember I think they boy they're up around a thousand bikes a day in peak periods I believe and, and maybe 250 peds a day uh, and cars are only about four or five hundred a day. I mean, I, I believe I'm remembering that correctly, but it's it's a very successful installation, and it shows that uh, number one, you can have both peds and bicyclists using this treatment, and that it works in it can work as a uh, as a connector for a trail system on street connector for a trail system. Yeah, yeah. Do you know when the they actually installed this particular um, um, installation and, and dimensions and all that? Uh, this one was installed as a pilot in the summer of 2020. Okay. And after they had such good experience, they decided to make it permanent. Okay. 
Yeah, that that uh, explains a little bit to me. Uh, I haven't been back up there since 2020. And so I'm like, this looks very, very familiar, but just enough different that I'm like, uh. and the reason why I say that is because I, I have a video that I produced on that trail. And many of the the on street versions, uh, you know, the images that we're seeing here uh, were part of that video. So now now you've got me curious. I need to queue up that video and and uh, uh, make that uh, be part of the, the show notes and the description for, for this uh, this podcast episode so that you can see what some of that uh, you know treatment looked like before, as well as some of the cool aspects of the trail that, that you were referencing. So we're, we're sort of running out of time here, Michael. Is there anything that we haven't yet covered that you think is incredibly important? Um, we, and if we're, we're skipping over something that you think is really, really crucial from some of your slides, we can, I can see if I've got those loaded up and we can pull one of those up as well. Uh, I, I would like to touch on the results of the safety research uh, that was just completed uh, okay. late last year. Is that this one here, the safety performance? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Excellent. So walk us through this. What's going on here? So obviously the first reaction people have when introduced to this concept is, what the heck are you talking about? I'm supposed to be driving straight at this guy coming at me on, you know, how, it's just going to be carnage, right? So what is the safety performance of this treatment? And so I found some uh, research done uh, in other countries, and I was part of a team that just finished some research here in the U.S. on the, on North American installations. And all three uh, projects, all three studies, have shown crash rate reductions for edge lane roads over the standard two lane treatment, and it's. Uh, it's pretty remarkable in the U.S. where, you know, this concept is brand new to people. Uh, on all of these facilities, you're going to get some number of drivers who are visitors to the area or haven't been there before and don't know what the heck's going on. Uh, we, we found 11 installations that had been installed for at least five years and that we had that uh, good crash data was available for. And when we looked at these installations, we found a 44% reduction in crash rate. Uh, and of course, these aren't the high speed, severe crash, uh, crash outcomes. Uh, these are usually local roads, lower volumes, lower speeds, but we are having, uh, very good safety outcomes with the installations in the U.S. so far. And of course, same thing you see from the slide here. Same experience in the Netherlands. Their study was confounded a little bit in that they reduced the speed limits on many of their edge lane roads that were studied. Uh, Denmark um, also had some extra treatments they were doing with their edge lane roads. They would introduce traffic calming measures or reduce the speed limit, but they were seeing very significant crash rate reductions as well. So this treatment not only is safe, but it's a safety improvement compared to standard two lane roads. Fantastic. So how do we get more of these? Uh, well, so the exciting thing is, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. So the exciting thing is, is that uh, the Ashto bike guide uh, is due out no, it was supposed to be out this year, but it looks like it may be pushed in the next year. I don't know when it's going to come out, but everybody's looking forward to it. And the great thing is that this treatment is included in the Ashto Bike Guide. And I suspect that we'll see a huge increase in uptake once that hits the, hits the shelf. Uh, that will just give it more credibility, more awareness, et cetera. And uh, really... The big problem right now is awareness. Uh, I consider this treatment to be in the same spot that modern roundabouts were in the 1990s. They're clearly a great tool to have in the toolbox, but very few people know about them. Very few people recognize the advantages they confer. And so it's really at this point, 
there's a lot of education that needs to be done, a lot of awareness raising. And I appreciate you having me on to do part of that. Uh, so I think once this becomes a better known treatment, uh, that uh, it, it will be used heavily all across the, the country because there are just so many road miles of local and collector type roads that could use this treatment easily and successfully. Yeah, yeah. And uh, frequent listeners of the podcast and and viewers as well uh, will will know that I, I'm I frequently say that you know part of the beauty of the Dutch system and the Danish systems is that uh, you know they do have these other creative types of installations there. The, you know, the, the protected bikeways and, and protected infrastructure, separated infrastructure usually gets the most attention. However, you know, 70% of the Dutch network is, is actually some, sh some form of shared space. And, uh, and, and these are frequently used in those residential areas. Uh, and as we saw in some of the suburban contexts too, uh, as I was making my, my way out to the air airport. So, well, fantastic. Uh, Michael, how best for folks to follow along with your work and the work of these edge lane roads? Well, I would say the, uh, the premier spot to go if you're interested in this treatment is my website, advisorybikelanes.com. Uh, yes, it is the term I don't uh, prefer to use, but that's what it ended up being back when I started. So I've stuck with it. Uh, so advisorybikelanes.com is a great place where I, I store uh, technical information, examples that I found across the U.S., uh, and just a lot of resource links. Uh, we also have an email listserv that uh, people can join for free. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of traffic on it, so you're not going to be overwhelmed in your inbox. Uh, but if you're interested in in the treatment and uh, the nitty gritty and what's new, and what's happening, uh, that's a great place to go. Uh, those are the two main uh, resources at the moment. We are at the National Committee for Uniform Traffic Control Devices level. Uh, it's a volunteer group that helps create content for the MUTCD and Uniform Traffic Control Devices. We are creating content uh, to support edge lane roads that hopefully will be in the next version of the MUTCD. Not the one upcoming, but the one after that. Mm, okay. uh, and of course, the Ashto Bike Guide uh, will should be included in there when it's published. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot happening, and I see, you know, that snowball is rolling down the hill. It's getting bigger and bigger. The uptake is starting to occur. I think we have almost 60 installations in the U.S. right now, uh, and that's since 2011. So it's happening. It's going to happen. Fantastic. Michael Williams, it has been such a great pleasure to uh, chat with you here today. And uh, hey, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you, John. Thank you all so much for tuning in to episode number 95 of the Active Towns podcast. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation about edge lane roads and are curious to learn more about their possible applications within your neighborhoods. The fact is, is that many of our streets and communities would benefit from this type of treatment. Be sure to check out all the photos and links in the show notes and on the landing page for this episode at activetowns.org. That's all for this week's episode, but first, a final reminder. Please help me to grow the culture of activity movement by making a donation to Active Towns, spreading the word, and subscribing. Thank you all so very much for your support and for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.